What is up my dashing dudes and darling dames? I am the Hans TV, and welcome back to the subreddit that just makes you feel bad for what hotel workers have to put up with. It's r slash tales from the front desk. Our first proof for today comes from VDubbug68. Non-refundable means what now? Our office is open limited hours at the moment, for the big obvious reason. And I opened up this morning to find in our inbox a reservation notification for a booking for tonight. At a barely break-even net rate via Botel Heads. Booking made at 1am, and a follow-up email from the guest at 1.30am, that basically demanded a full refund immediately because our partner had just had a seizure. She's taking him to hospital. She's really stressed out that she can't reach anyone in the office, and even though she knows she chose a non-refundable booking, she wants her money back under the circumstances. Otherwise, she'll call the State Consumer Affairs Department to chase us to give her money back. Now, I was skeptical of the seizure story, and my normal inclination would be to tell her that non-refundable means non-refundable, and our normal cancellation policies are 24 or 72 hours notice required anyway, depending on rate. But something about this one just rang the alarm bells in my head. So I replied immediately and told her that fine, we'd cancel on our end and apply no charges, but she booked through an agency and she'd need to get her refund from them because she didn't pay us for the booking. Immediate one line email reply, yes, I have paid for the booking. I've attached my credit card transaction here. Right. I reply again, yes, you get charged on booking and that's how OTAs work, but you paid them, not us. So I can't refund you money I don't have. Please follow up with this, who I could tell from the payment screenshot she'd book with, for your refund. Half an hour later, I receive a call from her. She tells me she's spoken with them and they told her the hotel won't offer a refund, but she told them she had an email saying we would. They told her they'd call me immediately to approve the refund, but if so, they'd only offer a credit for a future booking on their site, which she felt was entirely inappropriate as, they just want to keep my money. No duh. I let her know that they hadn't called yet, but that I'd certainly approve the fee-free cancellation when they do. She complains again about wanting to contact Consumer Affairs because of the circumstances, and about how you'd think given the current climate, which I took to mean COVID-19, that agents and hotels should be more flexible. I explained to her that non-refundable basically means no refunds under any circumstances. And if they showed that policy at the time of booking, then there wouldn't be anything Consumer Affairs would be able to help her with, though the company were offering a gesture of goodwill if they were going to give her credit. Awkward silence. Well, that's very disappointing. Okay. I reiterate that the hotel wasn't processing any fees and I'd let the agent know that. Then I make the mistake of beginning my sign off to the call with, well, we wish your partner a speedy recovery. At which point I'm cut off by a virtual screaming tirade about how that's not going to happen because he's probably dying right now as his seizure was the result of his detoxing. And this is the third time he's gotten clean, but it'll probably demonetize him while she's on the phone chasing up an $80 refund for accommodation she won't be using and she just wants her money back, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen. Hangs up. What? So many questions. Why book a hotel room and a city outing so soon after lockdown relaxes with someone detoxing? Why choose a non-refundable rate if your partner is in such a fragile state in the first place? Why, if money is so tight that $80 is make or break and you have to chase up hotels and OTAs while your partner is on their deathbed, are you spending money on a night in a hotel anyway? And how did you expect to be able to leave an incidentals guarantee? What do you think Consumer Affairs is going to do for you when you just decide you don't like the conditions you agreed to? Why, considering the current climate of COVID-19 and its effects on the travel industry, do you think there is absolutely nothing on you as the traveler to take responsibility for the booking conditions that you select and agree to at the time of booking? And, for F's sake, why are you on the phone to me if your partner is literally demonetizing right now? Our next post comes from Siggy Hyena, tired of OTA and locals. I've been working at this hotel for eight months now, worked all three shifts and originally hired for part-time night audit. Now, second shift with my co-worker switching me shifts. I'd say with COVID-19, this job has gotten harder, but it's pretty much stayed the same. Working at a motel, basically I see all sorts. Lost my mind trying to explain to guests the difference of price between online and in property. We are a franchise and we'll charge you an arm and a leg. We also get half of our business from walk-in and locals. Had all these shady demands from the owners too. They don't give a crap about our health nor the guests. Our front lobby is not designed for air circulation. 
Yesterday, I had two guests come in, both OTA reservations. One you book through and then pay at the property. They thought they prepaid, but I had to inform them that payment was still due and there was no prepaid virtual card. I'm talking to three women in my little night window lobby explaining to them that I cannot take third party payment and payment must be matching to check an ID. Had to call a manager as at some point they confused the garbage out of me. Eventually had to cancel the reservation and have them book through a prepaid OTA with their name and their family member not on property, paying for it so they can check in. We deal with a ton of chargebacks lately and get a lot of locals, so we have a strict policy of matching payment. My second guest booked through a prepaid OTA, and after calling in and barely checking with my manager, I had to turn her away as she was under 21. She wanted me to switch the reservation name with the guy she's staying with that is over 21. But my manager said no, as we have strict policies and the situation can lead to fraud and property damage. I usually have these types of guests on third shift and not second. She tried to ask another guest to help her out, and then I told her she could no longer wait in my night window lobby for a ride and had to go. Found her an hour later wandering around the property. This is all starting my shift after the manager picked me up and finding a dead dog dumped in our dumpster 10 minutes before my shift. I'm just at a loss for words anymore. I went down to the comments, and user birdup23 said something amazing. 7 out of 10 people staying at hotels aren't the sharpest tools in the shed. My favorite is when I quote them a price over the phone and they gasp like I kicked their dog. Oh, well, this site here says it's for $150. Well, ma'am, are you sure you're on the right date? Online sites do that to try and trick you sometimes. Oh, you're right. This price is for five years from now, but you could still match it. Our next post comes from Corva. You gave him a refund? Really? So, I work at a Duper 8, which uses Synexit. Said system does not distinguish between dirty and clean rooms and finalizing a check-in. It'll show as dirty on the room inventory screen, but once you go into the guest info screen, that info disappears. Other systems I've used usually give you some sort of warning or ask you if the room marked dirty is actually clean when you actually check the guest into said room. But I digress. Anyway, a nice older guy comes in on my night audit shift to check in. Everything goes smoothly. Apparently I didn't notice that the room I checked him in was dirty. We have one housekeeper on staff currently, thanks to the Rona, and had had a busy weekend prior and she wasn't able to finish all the rooms. Fair enough. That's my mistake. It's something I could have noticed earlier, but missed. I should add, the room wasn't dirty as in trashed, more like the bed was used. However, did this guest call the front desk maybe to ask for a different room? Nah, he just made the bed himself and went to sleep. The weird thing is, he freaking complained about it in the morning. I mean, come on, it's an easy fix. Call me and I'll literally put you in a new room right across the hall. I'll even bring you the key. Takes under five minutes, if that. The front desk manager gave him a full refund, profusely apologized, and wrote me a passive aggressive note directed at me and the mistake I never should have made in our pass along documents. I could understand giving a full refund if the customer had called about it the night previous and nothing had been done, but he didn't complain about it. He just made the bed and went to sleep. So how is that your fault? How is that the hotel's fault for not realizing that? Our final post for today comes from wreck it Reich, entitled Brat Trash's Room. Hello fellow readers, this one is short and sweet so let's jump right in. Working my 7-3 to three shift and I get called up to the third floor by one of the housekeepers because she says someone was smoking in the room. Now, at our hotel, in order to charge someone the $250 smoking fee, we have to be absolutely positive and be able to prove that, in fact, they did smoke. As soon as I got off the elevator, I smell it. Before I even enter the room, I remove a beer bottle out of one of the light fixtures located just outside the door. I get into the room and it's trashed. It smells putrid. Trash everywhere. The carpet is wet and sticky. Blech. It's chaos. The bathroom has ashes on the floor, so I take pics of everything. Seems like they thought that if they smoked in the bathroom, they could blow it into the fan and get away with it. Stupid kids. Then. My housekeeper says, Mi amigo, look. I look, and she is holding a bag of puke with cigarettes put out into it. Ugh. Good enough for me. So I go downstairs, tell my boss, and he says, Let's charge those MFers. Boom. $250 smoking fee plus a $30 cleaning fee. Then we wait. We wait for the inevitable phone call I knew would come, and it did. Me is me, and dad is dad. Thank you so much for calling the blah blah blah. How can I assist you? Uh, yeah, I need to talk to a manager about these charges on my card. That would be me. How can I help you today, sir? 
Yeah, you guys charged me like $300. Bingo. I instantly knew who this was. Oh, yes, sir. Those charges are for the incidentals. Incidentals? I didn't even stay there. It was for my daughter. You need to charge her card. She had a prepaid reservation, sure. Yours was the only card on file. The only thing she was authorized to use that card for was the 35 incidental fee. Yes, sir. The incidental fee. Should any incidentals occur, which they did, in the form of wet and sticky carpet due to alcohol being spilled everywhere, a beer bottle and a light fixture, smoking in the bathroom, trash everywhere, and a bag of pute with cigarette butts. Silence. Oh, I'ma call you back. Never heard from him again. Yeah, that sentence about the uh, cigarette butts and the throw up, yeah, that almost made me throw up in my mouth. So we're just gonna skip over this. And all right, my dash and doing the darling dames, that is gonna do it for today's episode of r slash Tales from the Front Desk. I hope you liked the stories, and if you did, I'm going to link them down in the description as always. And if you liked the video, subscribe, share, drop a like, and a comment down below which you'd like to see me read next. A humongous thank you to everyone who subscribed and who keeps on subscribing over the past year or so. I can't thank y'all enough for what y'all do for the channel, and I can't wait to see where my community goes in the next few years. But with that being said, I will see you in the next video.